Well, I'm glad you guys were able to join for this segment. I think this is perhaps the third or fourth panel today talking about Section 230 and tech platforms in some way. This was not the original uh, intention. We were hoping to save it all for this segment, but, you know, what can you do? What can you do? I think we have room for a, a diverse range of perspectives here. So anyway, I'm glad I can uh, welcome you guys to do this session with me. Uh, and I'm happy to introduce uh, Mike Masnick, who's the founder uh, and editor of TechDirt, which is an awesome tech policy blog, which has been going since 90, what, how long has it been going, Mike? Uh, it depends on where you put the start, but 97, 98, thereabouts. Yeah. So like pretty early in the kind of early days of the internet and sort of cyber libertarian culture and Silicon Valley and, you know, pretty, pretty good, reliable, uh, you know, stream of takes on all things tech policy <laughs> and all the things my you know, people here in DC are doing wrong. It's a great, great site to read. If you haven't, I suspect many of the people in the audience are already avid readers of your content, um, or at least, you know, people tweeting in response to your content. Um, and then, you know, second but not least, I'd like to welcome Gigi Stone, who is a distinguished fellow at the Georgetown Institute for Tech Law and Policy. And before that, uh, you know, had a number of great positions in civil society and government, including the FCC, and I believe co-founder and head of public knowledge, is that right? Um, which is a, a you know, leftist center civil society group doing a lot of great work uh, also on these sort of conversations around tech regulation and tech platforms. So the topic we're here to talk about today is this idea of the tech lash, which describes essentially a backlash both among kind of the people, a popular sentiment shift, and also among policymakers uh, to be more hostile to uh, big tech, tech in general, tech platforms are a little nebulous about exactly what the term means. It gets used in a lot of different contexts. Uh, and really, we're here to try and refine that discussion a little bit. Um, the term tech lash was coined in 2013 by The Economist, which suggested that, uh, you know, the heads of these big tech companies would join you know, oil men and, you know, things like that in, in sort of public demonology uh, that we'd have a sort of revival of, you know, the trust busting and all of these sort of things we don't like about other big corporations. Um, and I think, you know, it's fair to say that in recent years, there has been uh, a shift uh, both among Democrats and Republicans to be more hostile to tech in different ways. Uh, you know, I remember not long ago, we were talking about the GOP is the sort of party of Uber and embracing innovation, and we were all very friendly. Uh, and all of a sudden, now we have Josh Hawley joining progressives, wanting to break everything up and regulate it and abolish Section 230, President Trump, uh, and you know perhaps the next President Biden are in agreement that we should you know scrutinize tech companies and revoke Section 230. And so there seems, at least on the surface, to be some amount of overlap. Um, but I would, you know, shoot it to you guys now to see first, you know, what is this idea of the tech lash? Is it even a coherent concept? Uh, is it a term you guys see as sort of meaningful and useful and how would you define it? Uh, and I'll start with you, Gigi. So I, I don't think the tech lash, I think you said it right, Zach. The tech lash means several different things to, to different people. Um, it, it, for, to some people, it just is a pushback against technology generally. They think it's bad for people's health and well-being. They think it's, you know, bad for civic discourse. You know, they're just like anti-tech, Luddite, whatever you want to call them. Uh, that's not the tech lash that I deal with every day, and it's not one I ascribe to uh, because I actually think technology is doing a lot, lot more good than it is bad. Uh, but the tech lash that I deal with every day is the pushback the reaction both by the public uh, increasingly, uh, which is something I want to talk about later, and policymakers to the size and the power of the biggest tech companies and the way they wield that power to have an impact on our economy, our personal privacy, our politics, and our public debate. And I think that's where you're starting to see, you know, is it coherent? I don't know. Uh, is it meaningful? Yes. Uh, and is it changing? I mean, I think if you'd asked me even six months ago, seven months ago, you know, and asked me, you know, does the public care? Or is this like an elite concept that, you know, only people inside the beltway care about? I would have said, 
yeah, I fear that that's the case. I think that's changing. And I don't want to talk about it now, but I can talk about some of the polls that have been uh, issued recently that show that public opinion on a bipartisan basis and sometimes more Republican than Democrat is, is going against the power of these companies. The big question is, what do you do about it? And I think that's where there's more of a partisan divide. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Mike, I think we may have lost your video. Is your is your audio nope. still there? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? You can hear us. Yeah, we can hear you. We can, I, I can't see you. Um, I can I can still see myself. I'm very pixelated. I'm very pixelated. Um, How ironic. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're being deplatformed um, yes. as you're you know. <laughs> It's coming after you. <laughs> uh, so, so They're Mark, violating my Section 230 rights. <laughs> so, Mark, I'll, I'll kick the same question over to you. What do you What do you think about the idea of the tech clash? I, I, I mean, is there something that you could call the tech clash? Yeah, sure. I mean, there there are a lot of people who are who are mad uh, about you know certain companies and certain actions, but it is not uh, a coherent concept at, at this point. And I think that, you know, I think it started out in certain policy circles and it started out with certain media folks. Um, I don't think, I think as Gigi said, that the general public didn't really care about it, but I think that certainly the message has gotten out um, that it it is. But I, I kind of feel like it's a mostly manufactured concern rather than a, a legitimate concern. And part of that is evident in the fact that there is no coherent explanation of what the tech lash is other than you know we don't like these three four five companies depending on who you talk to at what point and what they're mad about um and so you know there's clearly some sort of anger directed at at these companies um i don't know if it's fair to call it a tech lash because it's it's you know tech is a much wider subject than just those you know four or five companies um but it it does exist as a as a thing i just think that it's you know anytime you try and drill down um on what exactly people find the problem to be and how they would fix it again as sort of gg said earlier um you know you don't tend to get very coherent understanding or explanation I mean, part of the problem is, Zach, if you don't mind, if I just add in no, please. thing, if part of the problem is, is that the problems or the perceived problems with tech are multi, and, and let's say call them tech companies. I agree with you, Mike. It's like, and it's kind of what I said, right? Some people have a problem with technology, period, right? right. Cell phones suck and the internet, <laughs> you know, that, that's a whole other story. But, you know, the problems that per people perceive with big tech or the big tech companies there are either four of them or five of them, depending on what day it is. Uh, it's multi-headed, right? It's privacy. It's like, I have no privacy. My data is being used improperly. It's content moderation, right? I don't, they take down too much. They take down too little. And it's competition, right? They're, they're killing my small business. You know, I have to pray at the feet of Amazon. So that's, that's one of the reasons it's not coherent. Is, uh, is that, you know, people are complaining about different things. I think they're all legitimate, but it's hard to have a cohesive um, political movement when people have different concerns. And, and I mean, sometimes the concerns are conflicting in their own way, right? I mean, I mean, you already mentioned the like take down too much, take down too little aspect of it. But I think that's true in, in some of the other arguments as well in terms of like, you know, there are questions around privacy and, and the different approaches that people might have to privacy. And, you know, some of which might limit competition and actually lock in some of these larger companies. And so right. if you're talking about competition versus privacy, it's one thing. Also, like some of the privacy questions impact some of the free speech questions. So people who have arguments you know, uh, on one side or another, sometimes are, are, you know, conflicting with people who are having arguments on the other side, which is why, like, this idea of the, the tech clash as if it's like a unified movement doesn't, doesn't quite hold together. You know, is there anger about these companies? Absolutely. But, you know, it, I, it's tough to say, like, what do you do about the tech clash when you can't even define what it is in a way that doesn't contradict with itself? So first, I, I want to get at this idea. I want to come back to this idea you suggested, Mike, of it being kind of manufactured, because I think how the industry conflicts play into this is really interesting and important. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about what the sort of general public uh, feeling is. And, and Gigi, you mentioned a couple of polls. And I've heard this idea mentioned that since you know there, there are also 
uh, uh, surveys showing that people have a you know pretty high trust or high opinion of companies and their products individually and have a hard time you know kind of reckoning that with this idea that we might also be you know more skeptical of their sort of power and influence in our lives in different ways and so i want to throw that to you and see what you think and maybe if you want to cite some of the other polls you you mentioned as well uh, look i don't think it's unusual uh for the public to you know trust and like the products of companies on the one hand and then be trust distrustful of their power on the other hand right people liked at and t uh, and didn't realize that they were keeping them on, you know, black phones and and, and stopping innovation, right? Um, yet when AT and T got broken up, it you know resulted in untold benefits to the American people, and frankly led to the development of the internet. Maybe some people regret that, but um, so that conflict I think is not unusual, you know, when it comes to companies that they've relied upon. And gosh. You know, these companies, particularly now during the pandemic, you know, have been lifelines for people. So I, I don't think that's unusual. So there's been two main um, uh, polls and these are not political polls. So you can trust them maybe a little bit more than what we saw the last couple of weeks. Uh, the one was from Demand Progress that showed about half of Americans on both sides of the aisle support the Google lawsuit of the antitrust lawsuit brought by the Department of Justice. And again, it's, you know, straight down, it's very bipartisan. And that 62% strongly or somewhat agree that the economic power of big tech is a problem for the U.S. economy. And only 23% strongly or somewhat disagree. At the same time, like almost coincidentally, uh, the Pew Internet Research Center essentially found many of the same things. 47% say big tech should be regulated by government more than they are now. 64% say social media have a mostly negative effect on the way things are going. And, and he, these are the two that really, 72% um, uh, say social media companies have too much power and influence in politics today. And 73% say that it's likely social media sites. No, that's not the one I want to say. 77% um, uh, say that it's not very or at all acceptable for social media companies to leverage users' data to show them political ads. So those are, and those are pretty huge numbers. And again, it's almost split bipartisan where things start to diverge, as I mentioned before, uh, are around the content moderation issues. So just two more data points and then I'll then I'll turn it over to Mike. Uh, Sixty six percent say they have not too much or no confidence in social media companies to be able to determine which posts should be labeled accurate or misleading. And 84 percent of Republicans, only 52 percent of Democrats believe that. And 73% say that it's likely social media sites intentionally censor political viewpoints they find objectionable. It's not going to shock anybody. 90% of Republicans versus 59% of Democrats, although still majorities for both. So, um, you know, these are pretty big numbers. And if I'm working for a tech company now and I'm concerned about regulation, uh, I would be concerned. Yeah, and I think it's fair to, to be concerned, but I still wonder like how much of that is is just sort of manufactured public opinion in its own right you know it's it's one thing to say these things but again as you begin to drill down and and ask for specifics and details and what level of understanding people have about these issues i don't think that they have a real clear understanding and they seem to you know blame uh, you know, the, the large tech companies for a number of other issues that are sort of larger societal issues. And so, you know, like, um, you know, there was the network propaganda book that, that uh, Yokai Bankler and some others at, at Harvard put out uh, last year, two years ago, I don't even remember now, but it has all this data and research that basically says, you know, for all the talk of disinformation about the 2016 election and and the 2017 first year of the Trump administration, all of the concerns about, you know, Facebook and Twitter and whatnot being the, the you know, key vector for spreading that disinformation, what their research showed was it was actually Fox News. Things didn't go viral on social media until they first appeared on Fox News. Um, and so, you know, but we don't hear anybody really realistically talking about like, you know, the Fox News backlash or, you know, what, or however you would phrase, uh, phrase that, you know, it seems like a lot of the backlash against the internet platforms, um, you know, it feels like, you know, people were looking for something to blame for something that they didn't like that was out there. And, you know, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube 
are these sort of new things. And so it's easy to say, well, I didn't really like the way the world is going for a variety of reasons. What is the new thing? It is these platforms. Therefore, it must be, you know, because of them. Um, you know, and that's not to say that there aren't problems with these platforms, but I, again, this gets back to the idea that there isn't this sort of coherent narrative that explains why these platforms are the problem. I can understand that people think they are, but the the, the deeper you dig into their reasons, it just doesn't seem to hold together very strongly. So well, you, would you, you, would you say that? Oh, go oh, sorry, go, no, go you must read my Twitter feed from this morning when I when I complained. When when Fox put out a missive saying even if Biden wins the election they won't go on president elect, you know look, I, I I agree with you Zach that a lot at least initially and even to this day the enemies of those four or five companies are you know are manufacturing uh, uh, problems and I particularly notice that the printed press loves to print every story possible <laughs> that puts the platforms in a bad light. Like they'll, they'll do a, a, a front page business news story on a crappy little uh, hearing on the Hill and not cover anything that the telecoms or cable does, right? So yeah. the, 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 there's no doubt in my mind that there is a concerted campaign uh, by we'll call them collectively the enemies of tech, and and they <laughs> even include some tech companies um, yeah. to, to put the spotlight diverted from them and their problems. And Fox is another one that's behind this, okay, and shine it on social media. So yes, I I would agree with Mike that there's far too much attention on four companies, uh, where instead of a bunch of other consolidated industries, including industries that impact our democracy and our public discourse and media and telecom are two of them right there. So this idea, I mean, of, of sort of this manufactured part of this discourse, you know, you alerted to, uh, you know, maybe Rupert Murdoch, you know, talking about things like Section 230 or, or you know, the sort of hotel industry going after the statute because they don't like Airbnb or, you know, the, there's all of these conflicts, you know, kind of Yelp and Google or Oracle and Google or, you know, the, you know, UPS guys putting out this narrative that the the post office is subsidizing Amazon, which makes it into the hearing and the antitrust report and so forth. Can you, can you both talk a little bit more about, you know, particularly for people outside of DC, I think it's hard to understand that there's this sort of influence PR ecosystem that manufactures these narratives. Uh, I mean, the, th the, I mean, yes, that happens, right? So, so the companies will, will sort of try and, you know, point, point, uh, regulators and the press in, in a certain direction. I think, you know, part of what goes into that is that, uh, and I am not, uh, not the person in DC. So, but, but, uh, you know, there is always this effort to set up two industries against one another, uh, which is tends to be good for fundraising for politicians where they can say, you know, oh, you know, uh, we have to, to regulate this, this industry or pass this kind of law. And suddenly, uh, a, a, a lot of, uh, fundraising gets, you know, happens around a particular bill. Um, and so there's there have always been issues where you, you sort of try and set up what is the conflict and you always pick sort of two large wealthy industries in order to to drive as much fundraising as you can so i think there's some element of that um but you you certainly have you know with the um like to take one example, Hollywood, the the movie industry, um, thanks to some some leaked emails uh, that from the Sony Pictures uh, hack from from many years ago, whoever did that and and released them, you know, we saw that there was a plan by the the uh, Motion Picture Academy to effectively frame Google. Like they had a, a thing called Project Goliath, in which they were writing. Uh, subpoenas and letters for state attorneys general to to go after these companies um, and to go after Google in particular. And and in fact, that included a plan to try and get the uh, you know Rupert Murdoch owned Wall Street Journal to push this narrative uh, and to try and get 
uh, Comcast and MSNBC to do stories on how evil Google was. So it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it, you know, it, it came out in the Sony Pictures emails that this was exactly the plan, that they decided that Google was a problem. They didn't like the way Google had impacted their lines of business. And therefore, they had this whole strategy to sort of tar and feather the company. So, you know, for all the discussion about how much money and lobbying the tech companies spend, the the telecoms in Hollywood spend far more. And, you know, particularly, you know, the telecoms and cable, they have, they basically have a lobbyist, whether they're on staff or they're consultants in every, for every member of Congress, right? And- I mean, doesn't Google also spend quite a lot of money? They do, uh, but it's it's not as sophisticated, okay? <laughs> As I think we've seen in this last election, the fact that you have money doesn't necessarily mean you're effective. All right. You know, the, the companies that I deal with have had lobbyists for 100 years. OK. And they know how to lobby and not, and not just in the federal government, also in the state government. Right. Which is not, you know, that's meaningful right now. So it's, it's much more sophisticated. It's much longer uh, relationships. Uh, and much deeper relationships. So, um, you know, I have, you know, whether all those industries you mentioned, Zach, are all talking to each other, I don't know, but a lot of them are talking to each other. And they, right. talk, and they talk to the press. Because, you know, I'll, you know, look, I have plenty of problems with the tech companies and have been increasingly vocal about it. But I also talk to them. We're, you know, allies on issues like net neutrality and broadband competition, right. that sort of thing. And I'll say to them, you know, why don't, you know, why don't you try to push this narrative about, you know, this campaign against you? Well, nobody will listen to us, Gigi. So they just, their, their press isn't as sophisticated. Their lobbying isn't as sophisticated. They don't have the same relationships. And, you know, as much as we do battle with the other companies, they're really good at what they do. And what mm -hmm. and they've been really good at for the last three years is deflecting attention from their own competition problems, from their own content problems, from their own impact on negative impact on democracy problems and throwing them onto those four companies. So we talked a bit about the sort of the manufacturer of narratives, but you know, that may not be entirely fair too, because people, you know, hire lobbyists and PR firms and spend money, you know, on behalf of legitimate issues as well as on, you know, pure astroturf. So I also want to ask, like, to what extent do you think some of these grievances that are raised by other companies are are legitimate? You know, there's the sort of disruption of the revenue model for the news industry. There's, uh, you know, I think Gelp has an interesting argument with uh, Google on search prioritization of them sort of prioritizing an inferior uh, uh, product. Um, and you know a number of these other kind of ideas around uh, disinformation, algorithmic fairness, censorship. I think there may be you know even if they're being supported in a sort of dark money PR campaign, you know nonetheless they could be underlying legitimate grievances. And so I want to ask you, you know, what you think of that is you know of the manufactured stuff is real and you know has a worthy argument, and which of it doesn't. Look, I think there's a lot of worthy arguments, and, and, I, and I do think Chairman Cicilline, you know, the, the chair of the House Antitrust Subcommittee, and the report that they put out, it really bought the re receipts. It showed the many ways, in, in many, many cases, <laughs> using the communications from the companies themselves, showing us how they were trying to stifle competition. You know, I've long mm -hmm. thought Yelp has had a, you know, really, um, you know, uh, I thought their argument was rang true. And, and I think now, like I said, we've, we've seen the receipts. Uh, it, it always amazes me what stupid things put, people put in email. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I totally think that's legitimate. You know, what's not legitimate are, um, are the Republicans complaining about, um, you know, about conservative bias, because we know that to be complete and total BS. But, you know, some of these companies like, I think the media companies, and when I'm including the media companies, I'm not only talking about TV and broadcast and cable, I'm also talking about some of the print media. They're just pissed off because their business model sucks. You know, um, <laughs> I think that's I think that's really, you know, look, I, I am yeah. sympathetic to some of the arguments about local journalism, but I don't think the reason that newspapers went down the toilet is because of either Craig Newmark or <laughs> Eric Schmidt. OK, yeah, we yeah. Know where they went to debt service, they consolidated. I mean, there's a gazillion different reasons. 
Does that mean that there isn't a good argument for some of the bigger companies to try to help local media grow? I think the fact that we didn't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of strong local media, you could you could see the impact in this election. I think there's a good argument for that. But to but to place the death of journalism and particularly print journalism mm-hmm. entirely on Google and Facebook is absurd. Yeah, and we have a whole day on this on Tuesday, so come come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I think, and I, I think that's important, right? That like again, it's it's the sort of you know correlation versus causation thing, you know, and and as you you know, if you watch what happened, you know, in the sort of late uh, you know aughts when everyone all the newspapers started blaming craigslist until about 2011 2012 and then suddenly it was all google's fault and then it was facebook's fault you know this was going to happen no matter what you know these the the newspapers you know effectively made uh you know little to 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 no effort to really adapt to an internet which completely changes the model on which they had been based for a century previously and and the, you know whatever little efforts they made to adapt were you know often in the wrong direction putting up you know paywalls that didn't work well um you know trying to to overwhelm a page with ads that were just more annoying than anything else and then you have situations where like you know they they love to blame google news and yet google news is sending a ton of traffic if they had been prepared to to take that traffic and do something useful with it and to try and build loyalty from from a local audience you know they had real opportunities to do stuff and they didn't take any of those opportunities and now they're whining about it um and so i think you know there are a lot of these arguments that are kind of completely bogus and as you look more closely at them they're they're problematic again that doesn't mean that there aren't problems and like you know, I think the Yelp example is an interesting one. And and to this day, and I've written this a few times, I don't understand why Google didn't just do exactly what Yelp has asked for, which is just mix in the the Yelp and other results and let their let Google's own algorithm decide determine which of the local results are are better. Um, but at the same time, you know, because I don't think that would have impacted Google very much, and then Yelp would would you know not have that one thing that it was complaining about. At the same time, you know the the biggest thing that it has has made yelp what it is today was was the rise of mobile and the fact that everyone just puts yelp on their mobile phone and that's got nothing to do with the google aspect to it there are all of these different things you know happening where there are some legitimate complaints but you know the trick is to to dig in and understand which parts are actually legitimate which parts are decisions that these companies made that had perfectly reasonable non nefarious explanations for them uh and, and then look at them seriously but it, it feels to me that very few people are doing that i mean even with the the Cicilline report it felt like you know uh, a bunch of the things that were put in there you know they they took a situation and then presented it in the most nefarious framing possible when you could look at it and say like no there's there are non nefarious reasons why those decisions were made that wasn't just about like crushing the competition and destroying everybody in our path uh but that were like you know this is probably better for our users um and so you know i i, I think that like said that's the reason we're doing it is to crush our competition you know i mean you know like i said they bought the research. Sure. You know? there, there are some there are some cases where that's an issue right and so but but dealing with those and not throwing in all those other ones is what i'm talking about like if we want to have a discussion of what the actual issues are with tech and competition and privacy which again there are issues involved in all of those things then you know you have to separate out which of those things are the serious issues and why they're serious and how they got to the way that they did and this is another thing that i've brought up a bunch that nobody wants to talk about is like you know why you know what what did we already have in place that led to this world everybody's talking about like you know setting up new new legislation and all these things and you know i've talked to a whole bunch about the the cfaa and you know this law that uh, you know, was designed to be sort of like this anti-hacking law and then became this anti-anything bad on computers law, which Facebook in particular has used to stop competition, right? So, you know, there was this company Power that wanted to build a sort of uh, multi-social network interface that would, you know, go in and pull out data from Facebook and, you know, 
back in the the you know 2010 time frame when there were other social uh, competitors to Facebook, it would build a sort of universal dashboard for you. And Facebook sued them saying that it was like unlawful hacking under the CFAA, even though the users of power were handing over their credentials and saying, I want you to do this on my behalf. Uh, Facebook claimed that that was that was a violation of a hacking law, and they won in court. And and you know that has really cut back on on the ability to build real competition. Uh, whereas if it was a different way, where you know if other companies could go in and build on the social network, social graph that Facebook has built, you could build a competition, you know, build the competition off of them. Uh, but nobody seems to want to go back and deal with those things. They want to try and you know go straight to to antitrust law, which I I don't think presents the right remedies for this thing. They want to pass you know privacy laws that they're you know putting in California ballots without anybody understanding what it means. Um, you know all of these approaches are you know sort of very broad brush approaches that are based on like this thing looks bad. We must do something about it, but without actually understanding the nuances of what's going on. And whether or not the the proposed remedies will actually solve the the actual bad things. Well, Zach, I just got to weigh in here because look, mm -hmm. any I, I agree with Mike that antitrust is not the only answer. I think there needs to be more than that. I think we need to have a comprehensive consumer privacy law and data protection law. I think we, it's not going to happen if you know uh, if Congress is divided. But I think there needs to be consideration of a a, a regulatory agency like my old boss, Tom, Tom Wheeler, talked about, to look at online platforms. But antitrust law is irretrievably broken, and that's because of, you know, basically 40 years of jurisprudence that has that looks at only uh, the, the so-called benefit to consumers as, as, as reflected in prices. So, you know, I think if there's one thing that Congress should be doing, and Congress perhaps could do, uh, under even under a split government is is to try to strengthen the antitrust laws so they're not meaningless because they're they're almost meaningless now, and you know this the Google lawsuit you know for all its alleged good intentions and I think it was political even though I agree that <laughs> there needs to be antitrust action is brought on the narrowest grounds and on the weakest grounds and with the precedent that's out there now I think is is not going to succeed so I, I look forward to seeing what the states are going to bring forward eventually, because I think it needs to be broader and it needs to be stronger. But I, I'm dubious that anything is going to succeed uh, with how antitrust law is right now. But, but, and I think, I think that's important for a variety of reasons. I think you're right. I mean, I think the DOJ's antitrust case is, is incredibly weak. Um, and you go through and you look at the details and it's going to fail. And I've talked about this. Like if you actually support antitrust, you shouldn't support the DOJ's effort because it's going to fail. And whether or not somebody's going to have the appetite to then go and, and do a more targeted one, I don't know. Like, yes, the states are working on theirs and yes, they'll combine it with the DOJ's one. Um, and so who knows? We'll see what actually comes out of it. I have very little faith that the states are going to do much better of a job of it than than the DOJ and and you know some people can disagree on that but uh, you know my issue is that you know if we just keep talking about this in these broad terms without understanding the actual issues and the impact I mean you know in a in a previous panel I know people were talking about the GDPR and that's an example of you know in Europe where you had this data protection law put in place. Um, and as a whole bunch of people warned, uh, you know, all it's really seemed to do is give more power to Google and Facebook, even though everybody, when they were talking about it, were saying, oh, we're finally going to, you know, rein in the power of Google and Facebook. And all they did was create this massive compliance cost, which Google and Facebook can handle, and everybody else gets screwed. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about all of the, the rhetoric around the tech lash. And that includes on the antitrust side that all we're going to end up doing is just empowering these large companies and sort of locking them in as, you know, these are now highly regulated entities and you know, sort of block out the ability of competitors to, to come in and, and, you know, chip away as we've seen happens over and over again in, in the tech industry. But they don't have that ability. That's the problem. Look, and I'm with you, Mike, and, and you've seen, you know, in, in my rhetoric, particularly around section 230, uh, at, you know, everything that's been proposed in Congress so far would screw the little guy and, and, it would, and Facebook and Google and, and Twitter would handle it just fine. So I'm, I'm with you 100% on, you know, not throwing out the babies with the big bathwater. 
Uh, but you know, I, I still think there are targeted ways and, and yes, understanding is really important. That's why Zach's work on, uh, reviving the office of technology is yes. important, uh, to, to handle some of the problems of, of, of the big companies. Yeah. And, and, and I don't disagree. I just, I want to see what those arguments are because I, I, I feel like I haven't seen the really good argument. Could there be a good argument for how antitrust would help deal with these problems? Maybe. I, I, you know, I just feel like I haven't seen it. And all of the arguments that I've seen and all of the remedies that I've seen suggested, I don't think actually helps. And I, I, I you know, that's, that's my problem with it. And I feel like so much of it is driven by, you know, by this feeling that like, oh, you know, these, these companies are bad, therefore we must do something about it. You know, I did this, this um, sort of experiment. I can't remember how long ago, because time has, you know, lost all meaning these days. <laughs> but uh, where I did this post once where I said, you know, do people want a better Facebook or do they want a dead Facebook? And, and you know, my operating theory is that people would be happy with a better Facebook that, you know, operated better, had more respect for privacy, gave users more control, users had more understanding of what it was they were doing on Facebook and what, you know, what privacy issues they were giving up. Um, and what amazed me was that, you know, it was probably like 80 to 20 against me where everyone's just saying, no, we just want it dead. Facebook is bad. And, and like, that's not, that's not a policy, right? That's not a coherent rationale for doing anything. And yet I, it feels like so much of the whole tech clash discussion is exactly that. It's that these companies are bad. Something must be done. We must punish them that it's punitive, not how do we make a better situation? And that's what scares me about it. Uh, that, that mean, look, I want five Facebooks. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, no, I want, I want, I want, you know, a thousand Facebooks. I want, I want 20,000 Facebooks. I want to be able to set up my own Facebook and not have to worry about Facebook, right? So, but but like, how do we get there? And I worry that that a whole bunch of the remedies that people talk about, including some of the antitrust remedies, and certainly a lot of the privacy remedies, do the opposite of that. And they will make it impossible. They will say, you know, Facebook has to lock down this data more carefully, and they have to be this carefully regulated entity in which we will review everything that they do. And that that precludes and actually cuts off the ability of creating the five, ten thousand million Facebooks that would create a, a more competitive uh, scenario. So going to that point, you know, in the final few minutes, you know, something I thought was really interesting uh, in Jack Dorsey's testimony recently on the Hill. He talked a lot about their work on decentralization as an experiment for the, re the direction the platform should go. Talked about this idea of algorithmic choice where they might, might open up a variety of sort of third party algorithms for, you know, basically your kind of Twitter feed. Um, you know, this seems to play into some of the ideas you've talked about a lot before, Mike. And also, Gigi, I know uh, PK is now doing a lot of stuff around interoperability, probably in a little bit of a heavier handed way than than Mike would propose, but I'd be really curious what you guys think of that uh, direction from from Twitter. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm in favor of, of, of empowering users as much as possible. Uh, you know, data portability, interoperability, algorithmic choice, the, you know, choice, <laughs> privacy choice, right, uh, which you don't really have all that or at least not not intelligently or one that anybody can understand when Alvaro Bedoya who people don't know is a you know is one of my colleagues at Georgetown, a privacy expert, can figure out how to protect his privacy on social media. Neither can you. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm all in favor of giving consumers real tools to make choices so they can have the experience that they want. I don't think that substitutes for competition, but it's a good start because you know even if we put in place some of these remedies and the remedies work, it's going to take time. So in the meanwhile, in the meantime, we need to give people the ability to have the social media and, you know, microblogging and, you know, whatever experience that they want to have rather than having somebody on high uh, do it for them. And, you know, one of the things that I really uh, admire are some of the um, business models like Wikimedia, like Reddit, where it's not like the content moderator on high, it's the, it's the community doing the moderation. And that seems to work a lot better with a lot less drama than hiring professional content moderators, half of whom like have to go to a psychologist because they're <laughs> nuts. So I, I'm all in favor of it, um, uh, but I don't think ultimately, th that's not the ultimate answer. The ultimate answer is, is more competition. 
whatever way we get there. And and I, I think that drives competition is, you know, I really think that that is, that is a, a way of getting there. And I'll note that, you know, Twitter is going in that direction, or they're attempting to at least, uh, and they didn't need a, a sort of law to get there, and they didn't need a, a regulatory push to get there. They see it, I think, uh, you know, as a way to compete with Facebook and, and to avoid, you know, Facebook taking over the entire internet. Um, and they realize that this is a way that they have to go and they're experimenting with it and we'll see what happens. Um, I know that the, they've been working on it, uh, you know, a bunch behind the scenes and they're, they're trying to get, you know, get some stuff out there. Hopefully soon there'll be, there'll be some more public information about it. Um, but I, I think that there, there are real opportunities there. Um, you know, if there is that kind of interoperability and, and a focus on, you know, exactly as GG said, you know, giving more power to the end users um, and, you know, allowing the competition to grow naturally out of that. You know, that's, that's the, you know, I, again, to me, it's like the biggest thing standing in the way of that is again, the CFAA. I think uh, honestly, if you did CFAA reform and you started to see, you know, experiments like Twitter start to play out, um, you know, a lot of these questions start to go away. Uh, you know, you, you start to see there's an opportunity for somebody to build a better Facebook uh, and, and, and for people to use it without losing contact with everybody on Facebook. If you can communicate from your, your alternate Facebook into Facebook and, and back out again, uh, then the, the power and the hold that Facebook has on all of your data becomes less and less. And that becomes a huge opportunity for all sorts of entrepreneurs. Well, we're about at time, so I think we'll have to leave that as the last word. I'd like to thank you both for having a fascinating conversation. I'm sure we could talk for quite a lot longer on some of the intricacies of these issues and, and where we might be headed, but we'll have to save that for next time. So thanks again for an awesome discussion. Well, thanks, Zach. Thank you. This was a lot of fun.